thank the Lord for the message, in usual fashion, and um, I'm happy to announce the title of the message is, is Cry Unto the Lord. Now the mindset that God had me in while I was preparing this message is really for the youth of the church, that um, that this would just be a simple, straightforward message, and that the youth of the church would see and be convinced that that while they're young, even tonight, that they'd be convinced that this is the real God. And there's nowhere else to go. There's no other church to attend to. This is it. This is where the real God's spoken of. And this is where the real God takes action. And my heart's desire is that each child's convinced that they're safe in Christ and that they're that they're a sinner and that they know God saves sinners because they know that they were saved themselves by this Savior. So the, the cry of faith is the is the main point of the message. And I'm I'm not preaching that if you cry for salvation that, that you get it. I, I'm I'm preaching that um, those that are saved cry. Those that are saved cry. Uh, you can't help it. God give you a new heart to cry. It's going to come out of you. It's going to come out of you. <clears throat> Let's read. i got to turn there myself. Ezekiel 36. The phenomenal process God takes his elect church through is in Ezekiel 36. This process of salvation. Ezekiel 36 and verse 24. For I will take you from among the heathen and gather you out of all countries and will bring you into your own land. Now this is Old Testament way of saying, I'm going to save you. I'm going to save you. God's speaking, and I'm going to get to the text, is verse 37. Just one verse is the text. But to get there, we got to see God's method of salvation. And he's going to save his people. Verse 25, then will I sprinkle clean water upon you. That, that's happening right now. It's the clean word. The pure word of the Lord Jesus Christ the proper Christ, the one that effectively saves and pardons sinners. With his blood alone, I'm going to sprinkle this clean water upon you, and ye shall be clean from all your filthiness, and from all your idols will I cleanse you. A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. And I'll take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I'll give you a heart of flesh. That's a teachable, palatable heart that yields to God Almighty. Verse 27, And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and ye shall keep my judgments. There's no choice. And you'll do them. Ye shall dwell in the land that I give to your fathers, and ye shall be my people, and I will be your God. This is God sovereign, saving who he, what he will with his hand alone. No man puts a part into it. God alone single-handedly saves his people. Verse 29, I will also save you from your uncleannesses. This is where it becomes personal. I will call for the corn, and I will increase it, and lay no famine upon you. That's, he's just saying, I'll take care of all your need. And I will multiply the fruit of the tree, and increase the field, that ye shall receive no more reproach of famine among the heathen. I'll just take care of all your needs. Verse 31. Then shall ye remember your own evil ways. This is the personal part. And your doings that were not good. And shall loathe yourselves in your own sight for your iniquities. Those are your false coverings, your righteousnesses, your the things that you do that make you a good person. The things that you do that make you proud of yourself. To you think you're somebody that God better honor. This is your iniquity. This is what a new mind, a new heart loathes, hates, despises, rejects. Is your iniquities and for your abominations. <clears throat> Not for your sakes do I this, saith the Lord God. Be it known unto you. Be ashamed and confounded for your own ways, O house of Israel. Thus saith the Lord God, In the day that I shall have cleansed you from all your iniquities, <laughs> cleansed from all that iniquity, I will also cause you to dwell in the cities, and the waste shall be builded. Your religious scumbag self is going to be made new to where you will never rely on your self-righteousness again. That past is behind you. You look forward to Christ and you'll rely on Christ's righteousness alone. A fertile, true righteousness. And 
the desolate land shall be tilled, whereas it lay desolate in the sight of all that passed by. Before you were saved, everybody that you partied with and you're around in your life, they knew you were just as dead as they were. But now there's life there. It's a different mindset about who God is. And they shall say, this land that was desolate has become like the Garden of Eden. And they're right. It's returned back to that state, a good state. And the waste that was desolate and ruined cities are become fenced and inhabited, flourishing, relying on Christ, resting on Christ, living as under the Lord, obedient under the word for honor and love to Christ, not for salvation, but because of salvation, as an output of salvation. Then the heathen that are left around about you, people you're related to, people that you work with, people that you were friends with when you were a child, that they'll know that I, the Lord, build ruined places and plant that which was desolate. And I, the Lord, have spoken it, and I will do it. Now, this is the part that's the text. Thus saith the Lord God, I will yet for this be inquired of by the house of Israel to do it for them. The process of salvation is exclusively God's. In the process of God coming upon you and saving you, he's going to convince you you're a sinner. He's going to convince you Christ is righteous and perfect and pure. And he's going to convince you, I'm going to open my mouth. I'm going to say the same thing that's ringing through the message that I just heard. I'm altogether unrighteousness and Christ is righteousness. All the things I did before salvation, iniquity, false covering, foolishness before God. I'll have nothing to do with it anymore. And I want to know more about this Lord and Savior. His righteousness, His goodness, that's what I need to know about. It's the only thing the Father requires, and it's the only thing the Father will receive for salvation for sinners. So by way of introduction, the cry of faith that's explained right here in our text, that you'll be inquired, God will be inquired of by you. You shall open your mouth, dear elect, to God for salvation. This cry of faith is mercy upon you from God Almighty. It's not you deciding to cry unto God for something. God visits you first through the spoken message of the Lord Jesus Christ. Then that new heart within starts crying, I got a concern. I've got an anxious desire to be saved. I have a need. I'm doomed lest God intervene. Before that, you had no wit about it, no concern about it. You're self-righteous in your own works and your own actions and you're fine going the, the path you were on. God has broke you from that path, made you realize that all the things that you thought were good are evil, and now you realize you're 100% evil. And God calls you that, and you go, that's right. I judge the way God judges. God calls me evil. I agree I'm evil. God calls his son good. I agree he's the only good one. Of all men, of all generations, Christ is the only good one. Turn to Psalm 8, please. Psalm 8 is just nine verses. <clears throat> and I'm, Psalm 8 is talking about the Lord Jesus Christ being sovereign over everything. God the Father giving all power and principality and dominion over all things to Christ. That he's, he's a sovereign. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth, who has set thy glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings hast thou ordained strength because of thine enemies, that thou mightest still the enemy and the avenger. When I consider the heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him? For thou hast made him, that's Christ, lower than the angels, and hast crowned him with glory and honor. He resurrected Christ. Thou madest him to have dominion over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things under Christ's feet, all sheep and oxen, yea, the beasts of the field, the fowls of the air, the fish of the sea, and whatsoever passeth through the paths of the seas. O Lord, O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. That's what he said in verse 1. Look back up. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. He's sovereign over every single thing in this earth. And verse 2 is what matters to you. Your mouth, out of the mouth of babes and suckling, hast thou ordained strength. 
God Almighty has power over your mouth in salvation for your mouth to be opened as a new babe in Christ. A new revelation, a new reality. All things have, passed, have become old. All things have become new to know Christ savingly. And you now see, and your mouth explains the same thing that God explained to you in the message. Strength is of the Lord. Power and might of salvation is the Lord alone. Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings has thou ordained strength. If the strength is God's strength to say it out of your mouth. And it's because of the enemies that he might still, the enemy and the avenger, the enemy is your own conscience that says you're okay. Your own conscience that says you're a pretty good person. God's going to conquer that. He's going to destroy that. He's going to throw that out of your body. He's going to put a tongue in that says, Christ is the one that's right and good and righteous and holy. That's the one I need to look to. That's the one I need. I'm going to cry for his righteousness. I'm going to start crying now a different cry. Mercy. May Christ's blood cover my wicked soul. If it doesn't, I'll perish forever. I deserve hell. This is the cry. <clears throat> the cry of the believing. This is what blind Bartimaeus did. Turn to Luke 18. Look at blind Bartimaeus' story afresh. Blind Bartimaeus became a baby in front of a bunch of people. A couple thousand years ago, he was just a blind beggar in the audience. Christ was walking by and a huge following of people were around Christ trying to get to him and touch him and be around him to get healed and listen to what he was going to say. Luke 18, verse 35, And it came to pass that as he was come nigh to Jerusalem, Jericho, that's Christ, a certain blind man sat by the wayside begging. Hearing the multitude pass by, he asked what it meant. He hears the big crowd of people going by. So he starts saying, what's going on over there, folks? They told him that Jesus of Nazareth passed by. Well, he'd been preached to. He had a pastor that preached Christ. And he cried and said, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. He knew that this Jesus of Nazareth that was healing people and preaching the gospel, preaching the kingdom of God the way this new believer saw it, that all are evil except one. And this one good was coming right by. So he started crying, oh, Son of David, have mercy on me. And they which went before rebuked him and that he should hold his peace. But he cried so much the more, Thou oh, Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stood. Jesus didn't keep going. He didn't keep going with the crowd. Jesus stood. He stopped. Commanded him to be brought unto him. And when he came near Jesus asked and said, What wilt thou that I should do to thee? Blind Bartimaeus said, Lord, that my, I might receive my sight. That, that wasn't his issue, was it? That's what blind Bartimaeus said. But Christ gave him a whole lot more. Jesus said unto him, Receive thy sight. Thy faith hath saved thee. He, he saved him. He gave him his sight. He said, Your faith has saved you. Blind Bartimaeus didn't ask for salvation. He asked for his sight. The call of blind Bartimaeus was, Thou son of David, have mercy on me. The Savior that God the Father is predestined to be born through the lineage of David, the single source of salvation, it wasn't the matter of blindness. He wanted to see spiritually the Messiah. He wanted to know that Christ's blood was going to be shed for him. He was on this earth doing it, living righteousness. And he was about to lay down his life on that cross of Calvary and shed his blood for a particular people. And that's what he wanted to know about. The son of David, is it for me? Is this blood being shed for me? And that's what he, the answer was, your faith has saved you. Blind Bartimaeus didn't say, I know I had faith. He said, I got faith. That's what the cry was back when you're in the ditch, off to the wayside, thinking to yourself, I'm doomed. I can't do one thing to help myself. I need that Messiah that's on this earth right now. Live in righteousness. And I believe the pastor when he says, I'm 100% evil, and that Jesus is 100% righteous. And he's right here right now. I'm going to cry for him. There's no other where to go. I can't do one thing to help myself. Verse 43, and immediately he received his sight. <laughs> that didn't even matter. He, he, followed, he glorified God. <clears throat> Nobody glorifies God except the new hearts within. 
We glorify ourselves until our last moment on this earth unless God intervened. God intervened on this man's behalf. He gave him his sight, but he saved him with faith that he gave him days before through the message to start crying. To start crying. That's the point of this message. Don't live your life on the sideline. Cry unto this Messiah for salvation. Cry believingly. Cry out continually. That's the next point. Turn to Luke 18. Or verse 1 of 18. We're already in 18. Verse 1, next page back. There was a city. There was in a city a judge. Luke 18, verse 2. There was a city with a judge in it that feared not God, neither regarded man. And there was a widow in that city, and she came unto him, saying, Avenge me of mine adversary. She had an enemy that treated her terribly, somehow in some way, and she wanted revenge. She wanted justice to be paid. There needs to be justice. She didn't have a husband to help her. She's a widow. She's helpless of herself. She needs the judge to help. And he would not for a while. But afterwards he said within himself, Though I fear not God, nor regard man, yet because this widow troubleth me, I will avenge her, lest by her continued coming she weary me. Christ is teaching a very simple fact. Even a wicked, undone sinner in their lifetime will support somebody that just keeps on a coming. He knew she was a widow. There's nowhere else for her to go. She doesn't have a, a family of fortitude of people to support her. She's just got me. And she's going to keep coming back. Her eyes are nowhere else. She's going to keep coming back and keep coming back. I'm going to just give it to her. It's common sense. This is how even a foolish man judges things. So then Christ goes on, verse 6. Hear what the unjust judge saith. And shall not God avenge his own elect? Well, well, God's holy and righteous. If this unjust judge comes to this conclusion when you continually come to him, what about your heavenly father? You come to him relentlessly, directly, consistently? Shall not God avenge his own elect which cry day and night unto him? There's the elect. They're crying day and night. I've got to have a Savior. There's no way I can die out of this life not knowing that he died for me. I've got to know. I've got to be convinced. Verse 8, I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth? Faith cries. Faith waits. Christ's work is the only means of salvation. Faith cries, would it be that it's for me, Christ's work on my behalf? I've got to know. This is what faith cries continually. From the point of salvation, it cries, and it cries out persistently. Turn to Luke 11 to see a persistent story. Luke chapter 11 now. And these, I pray, are boiled down so simple that even the youngest here listening can understand the logic of crying unto God and don't let your tongue sit idle, kids. You, you've heard this message, cry unto this God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Dear God Almighty in heaven, your son died for a particular people. Is it me that he died for? <clears throat> Luke chapter 11, verse 5. Christ again preaching and teaching, which of you shall have a friend and shall go unto him at midnight and say unto him, friend, lend me three loaves for a friend of mine is... On his, on his journey has come to my house and I have nothing to set before him to eat. And he from within shall answer and say, trouble me not, the door is now shut and my children are with me in bed. I cannot rise and give thee. You're snug, tucked away. You don't want to help a friend in that situation, do you? It's too late. It's the middle of the night. Just let me sleep. I say unto you, though he will not rise and give him because of his friendship, yet because of his imp importunity that's his persistent he will rise and give him his he'll give him three loaves he'll give him six loaves i just want you out of here i want to get back to bed the persistence of a sinner crying for mercy from god almighty is this relentless i i don't have anywhere else to go the whole city shut down there's no other resources for bread i've got a need that only you can meet and i know you can meet it i know you got the food in there 
You've got it in there. And I'm not looking for anyone else to help me. And I'm waiting here until you open that door and give it to me. And I'm crying for it. Have mercy on me. It's nothing I deserve. It's your grace if you give it to me. If you pass by, so be it. I deserve condemnation. You stop by. Oh, thank you so much. But I'm not going anywhere else. There's nowhere else to go. This is what Christ is preaching. Verse 9, And I say unto you, Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For every one that asketh receiveth. And he that seeketh findeth. And to him that knocketh, it shall be opened. Are you asking? Are you seeking? Are you knocking? Are you concerned? Are you concerned about your next breath? Is it going to be in paradise? Or is it going to be in torment? Everyone that asks receives is what verse 10 says. This isn't a work that man does. This is the mercy of God that you start asking. If God's not merciful to you, you'll think this message is just another one you chuck on the pile and you junk at home. Burn later. If you have a new heart from this message, you say, I better ask. I'm going to ask. There's no other. i got to have it. I lack. That's why I'm asking. Verse 11, we have to read on. If a son shall ask bread of any of you that it's a father, will you give him a stone? Yeah, that's worthless. Of course you won't give him a stone if he needs bread. Or if he ask of a fish, will you, you give him a serpent? It's a mean trick. Verse 12, or if he ask of an egg, will you offer him a, a scorpion? If ye then being evil, and he's talking to elect. He's talking to elect, saved elect. If you then being evil know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask? Aren't you asking? You've heard this message week in and week out. Your parents tell it to you. Your parents live it in front of you. And you're not asking? You Be engaged. This God and this only God can give you the Holy Spirit that settles your conscience to rely on Christ's work alone for salvation. It settles it forever. There's no more torment and fear of punishment and pain and hell and suffering. It's settled because Christ paid all that debt. And that blood, once it's applied to your conscience through the Holy Spirit, it settles all those woes and you know for sure, I'm safe in the blood of Christ. It was shed for me. And his holiness is charged to me and all my evil. And that's all I ever contributed. That's all washed away in the blood of Christ. I had nothing to contribute to salvation. My cry was his gift of mercy to me. It wasn't something I did to earn or deserve salvation. But the persistence of a saint that's lost. That's Philippians 2.13. That's God which worketh in you. Both the will and to do of, the good, of his good pleasure. It's Colossians 1.29. Striving according to his working which worketh in me mightily. And it's, it's Philippians 1, six, being con <clears throat> confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. He will perform this work the day of your salvation. He and he alone opens your mouth. You become a babe, a new child, reborn, the day the Lord visits you and causes you to say, have mercy on me, I'm a sinner, I'm 100% evil. By God's grace, this will come upon you. And it'll happen until Christ's return or until your death. It'll be the same cry the same day. Have mercy on me to do my job. Have mercy on me to be a proper husband. Have mercy on me to be a proper father. Have mercy on me to be a proper student. Have mercy on me to do anything right in this life. It's the same cry for the rest of your life. Have mercy on me. You supply all my ability, all my substance. You did it with the blood of Christ, and you do it every day of my walk. And everything that I do, it's all your work. It's all to your credit and glory. <clears throat> this is the finished work of Christ. Turn to John 19 in closing. <clears throat> Look at John 19. The finished work of Christ is the main point. You will cry. You will cry as a new babe does for help and care and deliverance and of the concern of the, your eternal soul. Until Christ shows you his finished work on the cross of Calvary is charged to you. And John 19 is a place where he explains this. And this overlaps into the message Rick preaches, 
preached recently, so it's really kind of neat. John 19 and verse 18, where they crucified Christ is where we stay, take the story up, and two other with Christ <clears throat> on either side of one and Jesus on the on, in the midst. So he had the two thieves on each side of him and Christ in the middle on the cross, and Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross, and the writing was Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. This title they read many of the Jews, for the place where Jesus was crucified was nigh to the city, and it was written in the Hebrew and Greek and Latin. Then said the chief priests of the Jews to Pilate, Write not the king of the Jews, but that he said, I am the king of the Jews. And Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his garments and made four parts, to every soldier a part, and also his coat. Now the coat was without seam, woven from the top throughout. Hmm. Predestined God's will that this would come to this point. They said, therefore, among themselves, let us not rend it, but cast lots for it, whose it shall be, that the scripture might be fulfilled, which saith, they parted my raiment among them. And for my vesture, that's my jacket, they did cast lots. These things, therefore, the, the soldiers did. The soldiers had no choice but to do God's predestined will right in front of Christ, right at the base of the cross, to declare to you right now, this ain't no accident. This Messiah came, died for a particular people at the precise moment, the precise time and fulfillment of all these prophecies. These prophecies he must fulfill to declare he's arrived and accomplished what he set forth to do. Now there stood by the cross of Jesus his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Cleophas, and Mary of Magdalene. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciple standing by whom he loved, he saith unto his mother, Woman, behold thy son. And when <clears throat> saith he to his disciple, Behold thy mother. And from that hour that disciple took her unto his own home. He adopted her as his mother. And this Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, saith, I thirst. Now there was set a vessel full of vinegar, and they filled a sponge with vinegar and put it upon hyssop and put it to his lips. And that's where he fulfilled Psalm 69, 21. Another fulfillment. Psalm 69, 21 says, In my thirst they gave me vinegar to drink. Here's the fulfillment of it. The fulfillment of the, of the prophecy is key part of Christ's earthly ministry. There's no other Messiah. He's fulfilling all these prophecies and the law of God Almighty, declaring he is the precious, pure Lamb of God that washes away the sins of the world. After this was done, verse 30, Jesus therefore had received the vinegar. He said, it is finished. These three words are the key to eternal salvation. These three words are what you can rest your eternal soul on. It, the work of salvation, is completely finished in Christ on that cross. There's no place earlier in time to go. There's no place later in time to go. There's no place in the future right now to go to look to. You look back on that cross at that time, 2,000 years ago, that's the only place your eyes should be focused. On this Savior that said these words, it is finished. The fulfillment of prophecy, finished. The fulfillment of the law, finished. The wrath of God the Father that would have been poured out on you, it's finished. It's finished. The work of salvation is finished completely in Christ. And there's another passage that I put in the bottom of your outline. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 4. How that Christ died for your, for our sins. Boy, may it be that he give you to see that that's personal. He died for our sins. He died for particular people's sins. Those sins were right there on him on that cross. According to the scriptures, he fulfilled the scriptures. We just showed that in two instances tonight. And that he was buried... And that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures, the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. There's your Messiah to look to. The Holy Son of God the Father, the one that fulfilled all justice, fulfilled all the law, and all prophecy, is the one that said it's finished. And he's the one that you should look to. You should rest on these finished works of Christ. <clears throat> and labor to enter in. And that's the use of the message. Hebrews 4.11 is the use. Labor, let us labor, therefore, to enter into his rest. Labor is to cry believingly. Labor is to cry consistently. Labor is to cry persistently 
until you see that Christ died for you. That's what laboring means here. Don't you sit around lazy. You open your mouth and you cry unto God by God's grace. You cry unto Him. Am I saying you can initiate salvation? You haven't heard a word I said tonight. It's got to be God Almighty in you doing it for you, and He will the day of your salvation. He'll, he'll cause you to cry. The response in Luke 8, 18, 8, we're not going to turn back there, but you might have noticed that the response to the widow's cry, remember that what Christ said, I tell you that He will avenge speedily. That word speedily is quickly. You cry. Your business is to cry unto God Almighty. His business is to speedily and quickly put the Holy Spirit inside you. It's synonymous. If you haven't figured it out yet, it's at the same time. So if you're widowed, which means you have no ability of yourself, you cry to this God for salvation. 